and you'll go to this site again. You you guys will have an assignment where you go here, but this is just it's it's politics one, and it has a list of every political party in the United States. And it's not just a list, actually. It has a little information about each one. This is the one I kind of talked to you about yesterday. But just for today, I want you to just briefly get some ideas. They have many political parties. Okay, so if we look at this, they you know the first one is the Democratic Party that they have shown here. Okay, and then they have the Republican Party uh, listed here too. And we'll enlarge this a little bit so you can see it more. And then they'll give you some history, and you can go to the the, the, the Democrat site and the Republican site. But then any party that is not the Democrats or the Republicans, sometimes they're referred to as minor parties, sometimes they're referred to as third party. And so we have 50, 60 third parties. Uh, so that, again, the, the name itself sometimes doesn't seem to make sense, but they're referred to as third parties. The Constitution Party is one, and they give you some history behind the Constitution Party or whatever. And if you read some of this, you'll realize they're a fairly conservative party. South Dakota has a chapter of the Constitution Party here. When we ran, when in the last presidential election, uh, somebody ran for president under the Constitution Party in South Dakota. Uh, uh, when you're voting in a presidential election, there might be 50, 60, 70 people running for election. You may not know that because most of the time they don't have the money or the organization to get their names out. And the reality of it is, is they're probably not on the ballot in most states because in order to get your name on the ballot, you have to have a percentage of signatures, and your state will set that in. It depends on who, who voted in the last election, and there will be a number. And it's not an unreachable number, but, but in order for your name to get on the ballot, you have to get enough signatures, and then your name's on the ballot. But if you are the Democrats or the Republicans, it's easy to get your name on the ballot. I mean, you have that many people in your state alone. You can just go to your own party, and you can just get a few of your own party, and you got that there. But if you're a party that's that's not a major party, let's say the Constitution Party, and maybe you don't even have a chapter in that state. It's not recognized in the state because you don't have an organized chapter in that state. It may be difficult to get enough signatures, or you may not have anybody in your state that's willing to go around and say, all right, will you sign this petition to get the name on the ballot? So sometimes when you look at minor party candidates, they don't make their, they may be running for, let's say, president, but they may not get their name on the ballot in 10 or 15 or 20 states or whatever. Well, obviously, they're not going to have much of a chance of winning. The fact that they're in a huge disadvantage to begin with, uh, just because of name recognition and so on, um, you know, they may not even get uh, enough signatures to get their names on the ballot. But the Constitution Party does in South Dakota. It's not our biggest one. Uh, we got the Green Party. We got you know other ones. America's First Party, Libertarian Party, is South Dakota's third biggest political party. Um, and I'm going to go to another PowerPoint here and show you something from that I have in my other government class with some numbers on it. I, don't, I didn't update on this one. But the Libertarian Party is big in South Dakota. It's not big enough to win many elections, sometimes at the very local level, at city level, and so on. Uh, but in South Dakota, we have it's a big third party. And then we have others, America's First. And, and again, I'm not going to go through all these. But what I want you to see is every time that we have this red here, that's another political party. That's another political party that puts people up or has put people up for political office. I don't want you to come in here thinking, hey, we only have two major parties. We only have two political parties. We only have two major parties. We have lots of parties. And then some of these parties here, this Canary Party is a very new one, founded in 2011, and I think it's dealing with health care. Um, but some of these parties are new, or not necessarily new, but haven't put up candidates for office, but still have a recognized political party. Um, but the rest of these going up here, these have all fielded candidates for office. Don't be confused. The Independent Party of America is not the same as being an independent. It's just a name of a party. If you're an independent, you're not a member of any political party. Okay, so I'm going to go to my government one here, and I just got to find it real quick. It won't take me but a second to find that PowerPoint. Uh, Just to show you the numbers in South Dakota when I updated it last fall. Maybe it won't take long. Okay, 
so so it might not. There we go. This is updated on October first of twenty fourteen. Okay, and if you you know how many how many registered voters do we have in South Dakota? And I'll update this one again here, you know, this spring, but the numbers aren't going to change much. 46% um, of South Dakotans say they're Democrat. But what does that mean? Well, that means 239,000 registered uh, Republicans, excuse me, 39, 239,000 registered Republicans, 175,000 registered Democrats. The next biggest is independents, people who are registered to vote but have not chosen a party. There's 100,000 there. The Libertarian is our, our, our third biggest party in the state, but they only have 1,300 registered Libertarians in the state. So they're the third biggest, but they're not even anywhere in the ballpark of these others. Constitution Party, America's Elect Party is a, is a relatively new one in South Dakota. Um, and those are the only uh, recognized political parties in our state. Um, and you don't have to have thousands of members be registered. Obviously, America's elect has got eight. Okay? And we've had different ones, but this is according to the Secretary of State's uh, uh, office is where I'm getting the information. Um, so it, when we say that we are a two-party system, that's because the two parties are the ones who, that's where most people are involved in. It doesn't mean we only have two political parties. We are not a multi-party political party system. When you look at systems in the world, there are basically a democracies are what are a two-party system or a multi-party system. A multi-party system is a, is a is a democracy where they have multiple political parties that win elections. So if you look at their house of legislation, whatever you want to call it, House of Commons or whatever, you may have four or five or six different parties represented within that. In the United States, we're a two-party system. Not because we only have two political parties but because we only have two that win elections. We only have two with power, and I'll talk about what we mean by power here. And this illustrates it. We have five recognized political parties in the state, but these are the only two that are elected in the office. And if the biggest indicator on how somebody is going to vote is their political party affiliation, which it is, then right away Republicans have an advantage. right? And Democrats would be second here. And then, again, the independent vote is very, very important. But if you're a libertarian, even if you get every single one of your libertarians to vote for you, you're still only getting 1,300. Okay, so you've got to somehow get the independent votes. You've got to get other people, and the chances of doing that is very, very slim. So it doesn't mean that they don't have a voice and they don't make something happen. What it means is it's going to be very difficult to win any elections. Minor parties can play a major role in, in America. They just aren't doing it with winning elections. Uh, they're not influencing legislation the way I think they would like to. They are screwing the stuff. Oh, in the meantime, anything anybody want to talk about? Nate, got anything good to share? I'm waiting for this thing to work. Anybody want to say anything to Katie? Because I think she'll probably watch it. Maddie, got any uh, message for Katie? I don't know if she can hear you. You couldn't hear him, Maddie said good luck. <laughs> Seriously. All right, so let's start getting some stuff on political parties. And we say, well, what is a political party? Well, a definition of a political party, then, is a group of people with similar beliefs. A group of people with similar ideas. Um, but it's more than just that. It's not just a group of people who share a similar belief. Um, it's a group of people who share a similar belief and then want to influence legislation. They want to influence policymaking in America. So, that, so not only do they share a belief, they want to get their members elected into office. And they want to get their members elected into office so they can influence legislation. Now, you also say they have a strong label. If we say the Republican Party, most of you are familiar with the Republican Party. 
Um, it's a label that we recognize. If we say the Canary Party, how many are familiar with that? Okay, a strong label, when we look at a political party, you want to have, uh, they, they really need to have, well, I guess three things. They need to exist in, in, in three different ways. A label that is recognizable. You know, the Republican Party, the Democratic Party, in, in South Dakota, the Libertarian Party. It's a recognizable label. They also have to have an organization. They got to have things in place that would help get their members elected. Ways of raising money, ways of, uh, uh, of, of getting information about different issues to their party members. There's got to be something more than just a name. They have to be organized in a way. Now, if you, when you get to be a member of a political party, and some of you are old enough to, to register to vote, all of a sudden you start getting stuff. I get emails from the Democratic Party. I get three a week. Three a day. I'm not three a week. Uh, it's like we're buddies. And almost always they're asking for money. Hey, donate three bucks or donate whatever. But also sometimes it's, hey, the Republicans are, they want to pass this particular bill and you should fight up against it or speak out against it or whatever. But it's an organization. Okay? I almost never read any of them. You know, I figure I, I can am informed enough without it. But, but it's, it's a way of contacting these people. Interest groups do this all the time, too. Okay, but political parties also do it. There's got to be more than just a label here. And then you've got to have a leader. When we talk about leaders, we'll see how, how leadership matters in Congress. And leadership matters uh, in, in, you know, in, in the lawmaking process. Political parties are not powerful in a sense that they can dictate to its members what they can do. A political party can't tell you to vote a certain way. They have no authority over its members. Political parties itself don't have a, 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 an overall organization that chooses who they will even run for office. In the United States, our political parties are weak. The members of the political party can help choose who's going to run for office. But the party itself doesn't have like this group at the head that says, right, here's what we're doing. This is our political party. This is the AP political party. You and you and you are running for office. They don't have that authority to do that. The people choose that. You know, think of the primary election. Uh, but the parties do some stuff, but they're not exceptionally powerful when it comes to a lot of ways. A powerful party, at least in, in, as far as we look at power in American uh, politics, has a label that's strong, that, that has an appeal to at least a portion of society. Right? Um, organization can control their candidates. In U.S., we don't have that. The party has very little control over the candidates. Now, the, the control they have is basically, you know, we give you a little bit of money. You know, if, if Allison is running for the, the Republican Party, the Republicans didn't say, hey, you know, if you don't vote the way we want, we won't give you money, but she can raise the money she wants herself independently of the party. So the party can do some things to her, but they can't do a lot. Um, leaders that can dominate a branch of government. Okay, that's kind of the biggest thing that the party is trying to do is we want to control the House. We want to control the Senate. We want to control the state legislature. We would like to control the governors and, and the presidents. Uh, you know, if your party can control, and that's just majority, you can get the majority, for the most part, that's control of a branch. Well, the Senate, it, with the Senate rules, uh, a majority is probably not sufficient enough. But for most states, um, in, in, and in certainly in the House, a simple majority is enough. We're not as powerful, when you look at political parties, is American political parties is not as powerful today as they had been in, in the past. I'm not saying our parties are weak and, and meaningless by any stretch of the imagination. But there's been some changes that have done, and you'll read the history there, uh, some changes that we made, and primaries are one of them, that have decreased the power of the political parties themselves. Uh, some other things, they can't give out patronage jobs, which would be jobs that, hey, if I'm elected, let's say I'm a, a Democrat, uh, and I'm elected, and you guys are Republicans and you guys are Democrats, I'm going to give you jobs. They say, well, they do that with cabinet members and ambassadors, absolutely. But they can't do that with, like, the Postal Service and other things like that. They've cut, they used to be patronage jobs where you just rewarded party members. So party elected, you guys were Republicans, you were holding a position uh, with a Republican president, a Republican, you know, now I'm a Democrat. You guys are all out your jobs. You guys are all in. So there's greater loyalty to the party then because it may deal with you economically. Uh, I got a job now. 
there are still some things that that we have patronage jobs with, essentially. Uh, you know, like I said, ambassadors or whatever. But those aren't really jobs. I mean, they are, but not in the same extent. We don't identify with parties as much as we did in the past. And you can be a member of a political party and vote opposite of what your party wants. Um, you know, I've done that multiple times. I vote with my party way more than I vote against it. But when it comes to voting, uh, the people don't have to. And even within Congress, members of Congress can go across party lines. You can be Republicans that can vote on a Democratic bill or vice versa. It, it doesn't happen a ton, but it certainly happened. Because if you're a member of Congress, especially if you're a House member, you're not representing the United States. You're representing your district within your state. And most states have multiple districts. South Dakota does not. We have one district. So, uh, um, you know, we're represent I'm a member of the House. Chrissy Nome is representing the entire state. But most states, that's not the case. California's got 53 districts. So if you're in California, you're representing just this one district. And you may have to look out for what is the best interest of my district, not even what's the best interest of my state, versus what's the best interest of my party or the United States. So sometimes uh, people vote opposite of what the party was, and the party can't do a whole lot about it. They can put a little pressure on them, but they can't do a whole lot. Um, they have very little control on who the candidates will be. Meaning that anybody who's a, a registered Democrat can try to get the Democratic nomination. And I understand we have primaries, but the party leadership doesn't get to choose who the candidates will be. They have some say. They can, they can pick when the primary is held, and they can have some say uh, and, and, you know, if they want to hold it as an open primary or a closed primary. But they have very, virtually no say when it comes to who that candidate will actually be. And because of this concept of federalism, where you know where the states have a ton of control, we have state legislatures. Uh, you know, and, and actually most of the laws that are made in South Dakota or the, the fact that South Dakotans are made in here, not in Washington, DC. And and we have the South Dakota Democratic Party. We have the Republican the South Dakota Republican Party. And they have more control at the state level than the national party organizers have over the states. And because a lot of the laws and stuff are done at the state level, even the national leaders that, 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 uh, that each party has has very little control over what happens at the state level. And so again, I'm not trying to say that parties are not important, because they, they certainly are. Um, however, they're not as important as, as, say, other democracies. And let's, let's compare them to some like European democracy. Uh, what is typical in a lot of, of uh, um, democracies is not candidate driven like we have in the United States, but it's party driven. But in Europe, the party itself will select the candidates who's running. Okay, completely different right now. It's not that, you know, in the United States, if you want to run, you run, and then the people of the party may choose, but it's not the party itself that's choosing who the candidates will be, and there, there's a difference there. Um, the campaigns in most European countries are financed not by the individual, but they're financed by the party itself. If I'm running for a political office, I may get some money from my party, but most of the money that I'm going to raise is going to be given to me it's going to be given to my campaign, you know, Tom Grody for president campaign. Uh, the party will give me some, but most of it, most of it is going to come from other sources there. Okay, so, so because I'm raising that money myself, I have a lot of control on how I want to spend that money and so on. It's not, I'm not dependent on the party to give me money. If I was dependent on the party, if the only money I could use in my election had to come from the party, then I better toe the party line a little bit more, right? What the party has given me is a label, and that label is very important. Because if you take that label away, if I run for president or any political office as an independent, my chances of winning are very, very slim. Not impossible, but slim. If I run as a Democrat or a Republican, right away my chances went up considerably. Because we know, again, 
And if you're a Democrat, you're more likely to vote Democrat. If you're a Republican, you're more likely to vote Republican candidate. Right? So that label is very, very important. So I can't just like completely ignore the party because I got to have their label. If I want to win an election, realistically, if I want to win elections, I got to have that nomination. I got to have that, that party label. But I don't need to toe the line with them. They don't give me money. Okay? So you can deviate some. You can't deviate completely. Uh, when elected in, in, in most European democracies, it's not a question of will you follow the party line. It's you need to. And if you don't, the, the, the party leaders will choose somebody different the next time. Now, there's a reality of that in American politics, too. If you don't toe the party line, you may lose support of the party, but you still could win the primaries. You know? Um, but, I mean, you can see this with with Boehner was challenged for the Speaker of the House position. And he was challenged by other Republicans. Now, what did he do? Well, they lost a little bit of leadership position. He scolded them, slapped their wrists a little bit. Don't, don't do this. But they're still members of Congress. He can't take their position away. And if they run again the next time, they can run again from the same party again. There's some things that, that can happen, but there's not a ton. Uh, when it comes down to uh, um, other types of, of systems, not every country has this, but most parliamentary systems is the prime minister is chosen by the political party with withholds the majority here. Haley, don't sleep in it. Okay. Um, it's not chosen by the people. Okay, so the party gets to pick the leadership of that. You know, and when your party loses the majority, then the majority party chooses the president. It's kind of like how we choose the Speaker of the House. Okay, whatever, whatever party has control then gets to pick the prime minister. And that's essentially how prime ministers work. And there's different combinations. Like, I think France has both a prime minister and a president. So does, so does uh, um, uh, Russia does, would you say? I don't think so, but maybe. Uh, you might be right. I never doubt you. Uh, but but a, a typical parliamentary system is there's still it's still a democracy. It's just you choose your leaders differently. Well, our president is chosen independently of Congress. Um, so again, they become more of an individual we're voting for, not a party necessarily. So what does what do political parties do then in the United States? Well, they do a bunch. Okay? They play different roles, and some of this stuff is going to come straight from your textbook. And some of the stuff, a lot of the stuff is going to come from other sources, a combination of things. Um, unify the electorate. Uh, bear with us to see what you think on this. Sometimes we say, well, the parties create conflict here. We create, we create, uh, create conflict where we have this liberal conservative divide. And we've seen that. So there's certainly evidence of that. But they actually sometimes take a more moderate role on things. The party themselves are not necessarily as extreme, even though the, the two parties are getting more extreme. Uh, they may moderate the, the argument some. And think of it as, you know, 535 versus two perspectives. There's 435 members of the House. There's 100 members of the Senate. Political parties unify their position for the most part. The Democrats will take this position. The Republicans will take this position. So we essentially break it down into two rather than being, there never would be 535 different perspectives on the same thing. But instead of multiple perspectives on things, uh, maybe we break it down in where, where individuals would have, uh, you have more of a party line there. So maybe it moderates the debate some. And you may not buy into that. You may not think that that's true, but something to ponder. Um, they recruit the best candidates. Now, this is not always the case either, but when you think of what does a political party do? Well, one role a political party plays in our society is they help choose candidates. Now, granted, it is people, but it's, it's a party that's doing it. Okay, so let's say that you are all members of a, a particular political party. The party wants the person who is the best, right? Because the best has the best chance of getting elected. And that's not always true. They want the person who... who they want qualified people. Okay, maybe the best person in this room is Nate. But nobody likes Nate. So he may be the best, most qualified person. But if he's unelectable, 
your party does, they're not doing any good to choose that individual. Right? And for whatever reason, maybe his history, maybe he's a jerk, maybe for whatever reason it is, he is a jerk. Um, but for whatever reason. So sometimes the most qualified person is not necessarily the most electable person. And there's a difference between that. However, if they're the political party, and you guys are all party members here, and let's say there's two or three or four of you that would be really good, that party is going to try to recruit you to run. They're going to try to get you to run for office. Now, let's assume that this is a political party, and there's four or five of you that would be really good. So the members of that party are recruiting very hard for you to run. They want you to go. Think of the Republican Party. You're trying to choose who are the best and the brightest Republicans that they have. You know, uh, so they're trying to recruit people. You know, uh, you know, Romney now dropped out, but you know, Romney in the past, or, or Jeb Bush, or, or whatever. Pick your people there. Now, from those, one of them will get the nomination. But you're assuming that whoever gets the nomination is one of the best that that party has to offer. And recruiting people is a key thing that they do. Sometimes you have people that don't want to run for office. And I can understand. Why would you want to run for office the way campaigns are run? But let's say that Maddie doesn't want to run for office, but we believe that Maddie would be a tremendous candidate and a tremendous politician. Trying to get her to convince her to run is part of the recruitment process. And the parties do that all the time. And some of those people get elected to state offices, and some of them get elected to national offices, and some of them get elected to president. Uh, the presidents are just the most visible. But the party tries to recruit people to run for office who they think would be good. Now, if you're a non-voting member of society, you're just walking along, doing nothing but just well, doing your life, is it beneficial to you that good people are running for office? Because if good people are running, then somebody's going to get, who's, who's qualified is going to get elected, right? So even if you don't pay attention to what the heck's going on, it's to our advantage if we have good people who are running. And a role that the, that the parties do is they try to recruit those people. They may be self-serving. They want the best so they can get elected. But it benefits us all as a nation, as a whole. Um, parties are organized. You know, when it, when it comes to organization, especially when in Congress, the political parties play a huge role. Okay, and, and when we look at, let's just look at the national level. If you're a member of a party and you are the majority in the House or Senate, pick whichever one you want, you're going to get to pick the leadership position. Okay? And I know we haven't said the House and the Senate much, uh, but in the House and the Senate, we have, let's use the House. We have the Speaker of the House. The Speaker of the House is the most important member of the House of Representatives. They have one vote just like everybody else, but they have more power than the others. And it's dictated over time and, and House rules. The Constitution doesn't give them powers, but, but the, the House itself can give them power. Now, the, the Speaker of the House is always coming from the majority party. So the Republicans control the House of Representatives. The Republicans will choose. The Republicans within the House will choose who the Speaker of the House is. So we look at partisanship or well, the Speaker of the House. However, most work in Congress is done at the committee level. If a bill is going to become a law, the first thing that happens to a proposed bill is it goes to committee. And the committee is going to do all the work on the bill. And most bills that don't make it, don't make it out of committee. Committees are huge, and they're very important. So what, how is partisanship in committees used? Well, if you have the majority in the House of Representatives, you also have the, you get a majority in every single committee in the House of Representatives. Okay, all of you, if you're a member of the House, you're all going to be a member of, of, of a couple different committees. But if you, if you guys are, let's say you guys are Republicans and you're Democrats, every committee will have more Republicans than Democrats in it. And the most important person in a committee is a committee chairperson. Okay, that's a leadership position. There's other leadership positions, but the chair people are, are important ones. Every chairperson is going to come from the majority party. So we know right now in both the House and the Senate that every leadership position is coming from both the, from the Republicans. Every committee chairperson uh, is coming from that. Now, the Democrats have some things like they have a whip, too, and they have a minority leader, but the minority leader doesn't have the power of the majority leader. Okay, so, so all of those positions are, are, uh, uh, in, in Congress um, are coming from the majority party. And 
when it comes to voting, it takes a majority vote for a bill to get out of committee. It takes a majority vote for the bill to pass through the House and the Senate. Talk about filibusters in another day, but a majority vote is sufficient. So if it's a Democratic bill right now, you think it has much of a chance of making it through either the House or the Senate? No. Partisanship makes a big difference. Your party plays a huge role in, in legislation. You know, President Obama can do a budget, and he has. But when the president gives a budget, it's just a suggestion. This is where I think we should spend money. The president doesn't get to spend any money. Congress has to approve the budget. They can change it. They have their own budget. He's not going to get most of what he wants. The Democratic, if it was a Democratic House and Democratic Senate, his proposed budget had a very good chance of making it. A Republican House and a Republican Senate, the things the president believes that, that we should have, probably have very little chance of making it. Um, when it comes to the executive branch. The president is part of the executive branch, but, but there's many others. We got ambassadors, we got cabinet members, we have things like that. They always, almost always, are going to come from the majority party. So when it comes, I mean, if you're a Democrat, you have a chance right now of the president appointing you to being an ambassador, appointing you to be. Uh, the head of health and human services, the point of view to be attorney general, to appointing you to be a federal judge. Okay, if you're a Republican right now, because all of those are appointed positions, now they have to be confirmed by a majority of the Senate, so it's not a foregone conclusion that, that the president gives what he wants. But if I'm a Democratic president, you guys are Republicans, you guys are Democrats, you aren't getting any appointed positions. You're not, I'm not going to appoint you as a judge. I'm going to pick one of you. Now, you may not get confirmed by the Senate, so I've got to pick somebody else. But either way, I'm not choosing from your pool. Okay, so those positions, those executive positions, and some of them are lifetime appointees. All federal judges are. Not just Supreme Court justices, but all federal judges are lifetime appointees. Those are going to be chosen by the president. And again, they have to be confirmed by the Senate, but nonetheless. Uh, so, you know, vice president, vice president comes along. I probably shouldn't have that because that's not an appointed position. Though they are chosen by the, the presidential candidate. Uh, but certainly Secretary of State, all other ambassadors, all cabinet members, and so on. They all are, are appointed positions. So again, the majority, having that, you know, whatever party, that's where those places are going to come from. Okay. So I mean, partisanship matters. Another thing, when it comes to patronage, Patron job, patronage jobs. Um, this is giving out government jobs, and I talked about this, to a winning political party. Not really used much anymore, but it has been used in the past. It's not used much anymore because it's not legal. Uh, we thought it was just wrong. However, again, it does exist at least in some extent. Like I just said, I'm not going to appoint anybody to be somebody, you know, a federal judge from it. It's not really considered a patronage job, but nonetheless. What else do the parties do? Well, political parties play another role. Go ahead. No, because it is like some of those positions, the president gets to appoint those. It's not the same as patronage. Patronage would be things that are not elected positions or not part of the, the government position itself, like ambassadors and stuff are part of the government, but like government jobs, they're going to get a postal service. Okay. So, you know, we're just going to give the jobs to only, you know, the Democrats. Okay. We're going to fire all, everybody who works for the, the, the postal service and give it to a patronage, just somebody in my same party, or at least a leader of each one. Okay. Those things were done. They were pretty common. They are no longer legal to do that. Um, so we don't see it much. And as you read through that history, you'll get into some of the patronage you know, when we started to switch from that. But it just seemed wrong. There's lots of things that we've done in the past. We say, well, that doesn't seem right. Okay, and eventually we get laws to limit that, some of those things. And every time there's a law that limits the influence of the political party, our political parties in America become a little bit weaker. You know, and those things have happened. When it comes to informing voters, 
political parties do that. You know, they, they may inform in a one-sided way, meaning they're getting their message out, but they're informing us on, on issues. Uh, look at the Keystone issue. Republicans are informing us uh, about the Keystone Pipeline. And the Democrats are informing us about their views on the, the Keystone Pipeline. And both of them are kind of one-sided views. We're not necessarily hearing both sides of the story from each. However, if we listen, and you listen to both sides, I guess you're getting both sides of the story, right? You know, both parties will have their own message. And watch the, the talk shows on Sunday morning. And, and, and you'll see how unified they are because you'll watch one person on one talk show and one on another, and they're using the exact same lines. You know, this is our party message that we want to get across. This is the words we want to use. Uh, but So they use, you know, the newspaper. They use the news. They use however they can to get their message out. But what it does do is that if we listen to both sides, we do become more informed. Um, and, and sometimes it may be particular issues that they, you know, bring up, and sometimes it may be candidates or, or individuals. And sometimes it's just a lot of just opposing just for the sake of opposing. And sometimes it's blowing things way out of proportion because the other party does it. And that's where we as voters and we as people have to recognize what is really important and what is just the party message that they're trying to get across. Um, and, and sometimes that's not necessarily easy to do. What do you think? We tend to listen to people who we agree to. We tend to flock to those who share a similar belief. Now, I don't know. You would think, if you look at the internet, you'd think, all right, we got tons and tons of information there. We should be more informed as voters. However, I think in some ways it makes us less informed. Because I think, not because it's more polarized, which I think there's that, because I think it makes it harder to decipher what is the truth. You know, um, all of us hopefully have some people who you can go to in your life when you have important questions. You know, and to me it's always been my parents. If I have a question on something, raising kids or whatever, that's who I go to. Because I know that they're going to give me at least uh, the, the, the truth or what they believe is the truth. Okay, financial advice, I'll go to my folks first. You know, uh, because it's nice to have one source. Now, let's say I don't have that. So I just ask everybody I know. And I may get one opinion and another opinion, another opinion, another opinion, another opinion, another opinion, and I don't have that one trusted site to go to or a small trusted site. Now all of a sudden I got lots and lots and lots of information. But it's harder to decipher who knows what and which one of that information is, is relative uh, uh, relevant and good information. When we had fewer news sources, again, if we have the three major news sites, CBS, ABC, and NBC, if they're trusted sites, then you, you, you're you not overwhelmed with information. However, I'm not saying that's better either because then they get to pick and choose what kind of information we get. And there is a media bias. So. You know, I, I don't know the answer to your question. Are we more informed because there's more information, or are we more confused? More is often better than few, though, isn't it? I don't know. Any other thoughts on that? Ashley, what do you think? Pretty intelligent girl. Sometimes the information is just completely wrong. I mean, look at the vaccination stuff. You know, where that's leading us now, uh, based on a false report done a number of years ago that's been proven false, and yet it still holds, people are still going with it. And then we're seeing the repercussions now, you know, uh, on some of this. So, so is more information, I don't know, I don't know. Um, I also play the role of a watchdog. 
We look at watchdog role. Think of them as tattling. I mean, that's really what a watchdog is doing, is they're tattling. Uh, how many got younger brothers and sisters? Or brothers and sisters, they don't have to be younger. You ever tell on them? You ever tattle your parents on them? Allison, did I see a yes? Why? Anybody ever tattle just to get somebody in trouble? may be true, but you, you, really your motivation is to get them in trouble. Uh, I think of my, my, my boys, and I got three of them, and they don't tattle much anymore, but, but they used to. There's one story, and I probably shouldn't tell this anymore as they get in high school, but nonetheless. Chase, when he was little, there was one time when he used to tattle and read all the time. He was probably, I don't know, five or six. I don't remember how old they were. But we had a house that we had an open stairway down the stairs, and, and it was one weekend where Chase was tattling nonstop. Read the disc, read the disc, read the disc, or I'm telling. And uh, it used to be when they used to hang out with you all the time. I'm not saying it's your fault, but it was when we lived in that house. But anyway, we used to tattle all the time. And, and finally, I told Chase, um, don't, I, don't want, I don't care. I don't care what happens. I don't want to hear it again. Um, you know, and, and Chase, I was upstairs probably watching football. I'm not probably being a very good dad. And anyway, I heard a crash down the basement and then Chase crying and said, I'm telling. And, and as he's come up, he goes, I don't want to hear it. I don't care. I don't want to hear what you're tattling on. Uh, and he goes, I'm not tattling on Reed. I'm tattling on myself. Um, he fell off a chair. He was jumping from one chair to the other. Apparently, he wasn't supposed to. Uh, and he, hurt, he had hurt himself, and apparently you need to tattle on somebody if you get hurt. So he was going to actually tell on himself. Um, now, he probably doesn't appreciate me sharing this story, but I, but I think it's funny. Um, but nonetheless, when Reed and Chase used to tell on each other, and there was so Quinn in there too, my youngest, uh, when they tattled, it was annoying. However, it also kept us informed, right? And some of the stuff was, was stupid stuff that they're telling on, that it's irrelevant. So also change the channel. Do I need to know that? But one time, Reed was up on top of, I think he was probably five or six. My wife was probably working. I was probably watching the kids. And we had this garden shed, and he climbed up from a fence on top of the garden shed, which is probably six, eight feet off the ground. And he's probably five years old. And Chase came over and said, hey, Dad's on, uh, Reed's on the garden shed. That's information I need to know, <laughs> right? You know, yeah, that's uh, something where he could get hurt. So sometimes the tattling is beneficial. Sometimes it's not. But it's probably better than... Well, what happens, I believe now, that they're in high school. Collusion. I won't tell on you if you don't tell on me. Because they don't tell me much anymore, and these boys ain't angels. Um, so which is better, the annoyance of tattling or collusion? Well, think of that's what political parties do. When somebody's doing something else, Benghazi, Benghazi, Benghazi. Isn't that what the Republicans are doing? They're tattling to the American people. Look what happened there. And sometimes there's nothing that happened there. But sometimes there is. You know, and the tattling is annoying, but what it does for us as Americans is it gives us information. And granted, they're tattling on the other party to try to get them in trouble with the voters so they don't vote for them. Right? They have an ulterior motive on this, but it still keeps us informed. The watchdog role. I mean, there's one time that Chase used to tattle on Reed all the time. He's like fake crying, and I know because I caught him once. Uh, because Reed would get in trouble. You know, if he was beating up on Chase, Reed would get in trouble, and then he would, I don't know, whatever they were doing, you couldn't do it anymore. So then Chase got whatever toys they were playing with or whatever all to himself. Um, so he would fake cry. Why? To get Reed in trouble so he could get what he wanted. He's not a demon, but uh, he's a boy. Um, but, but the parties are doing that too. They have a motivation for tattling, and that's to get the other people in trouble with you know, with the, with the voters, so they can gain control of government. Um, now, but it does keep us informed. So there's good and there's bad with that watchdog role, but they do. Now, the, the tattling of their lies are probably campaign commercials. I wouldn't believe any of those, ever, ever. They're all just lies and crap. Just, it, you got stuff you want to sift through and never pay attention to, campaign commercials. Never, ever pay attention to them ever in your life, and you'll be, you'll be a better person, certainly a better voter. And I'll give you some examples maybe on another time. But, but not everything a party says is incorrect. In fact, lots of it, there's relevance to each one. Okay? And that is a role that is beneficial to all. Uh, now, 
I try not to tell many stories of my kids now that they're in high school because you're their classmates. So just they probably don't appreciate it. Sometimes I embellish and make stuff up, and they go, that didn't happen. I go, well, it kind of happened. But these are true stories. None of these were embellished upon. Together? No, I don't think so. Unless they're both in cahoots together, which is rare. In some ways, yes. yes. It might not be a lot of ways. It's hard to say everything is bad here. The, the division between the two might keep us more protected as a people. I know. See that I shouldn't. I can't even deny. I said no. I didn't say any of that stuff. I could probably delete it. <laughs> <laughs>